Hi, I'm Joseph Garrett, and welcome to Games First, 10 rules for surviving the Section 8 Prejudice multiplayer. Ever wondered what the different coloured lines at the side of the screen when you're dropping in actually mean? Because you don't have to break at all while skydiving in. If you break in the orange section of the line, you will slow down your descent enough to be able to move immediately after landing. So to get into the action quickest, break at the bottom of the orange segment to be ready to move as soon as you land. If you were going for a more aggressive landing and attempting to kill someone with your landing, then you should break during the red section. I would however only advise this if you are attempting to destroy a vehicle or going for the falling with style achievement as you will only kill an enemy if they are already hurt or in a vehicle. Break at the top of the red section for the most time to control your landing. If you didn't join the campaign's training, set your overdrive to manual. Having your overdrive on automatic has no advantages and the extra control of manual overdrive can be really useful. The primary use for overdrive is for crossing large distances. It is ineffective during combat as you're unable to fire your weapon while overdrive is engaged. It is also useful for jetpacking large distances. Enable the jetpack while in full sprint and you will over double your clear distance. You can enable overdrive after 4 seconds of sprinting, although you don't have to be sprinting in a straight line. If you want to use overdrive from cover, spin in a circle for 4 seconds then straighten up and overdrive away. This technique is also useful if you want to make a large jump without a run-up. You may look stupid doing it, but it does work. I have the repair tool on all of my custom classes. It is probably the single most useful piece of equipment in the game. The uses of the repair tool go further than healing deployables and vehicles. The repair tool can also be used to heal damaged teammates. And if you use the repair tool while no one is near, you will actually start healing yourself. So get into the habit of leaving your repair tool equipped so that any time you're injured and not shooting, you can be healing yourself. It could just save your life. While the rocket launcher is the best device to use while destroying deployables, sometimes you will want two primary weapons. If you have a class without any anti-armor weapons, then the next best thing to use is the Mortar Strike. The Mortar Strike with Crash Rounds is extremely effective against gun turrets. Most deployables will be destroyed with one Mortar Strike and a few shots from whatever gun you're carrying. So don't waste a weapon shot destroying armored objects and instead equip the Mortar Strike. Enemy bases are easiest to capture when your team can spawn in the area but the enemy team can't. Capturing an enemy base often turns into a big battle that can take a long time. The easiest way to prevent this from happening is by stopping the enemy team from spawning in their own base. The first thing I try to do when attacking an enemy base is destroying their AA gun. This can be easily done by long range rocket launcher shots or by using rule 7 and dropping a couple mortar strikes on it. Once the enemy's AA gun is no more, it is safe to call in your own deployables. So as long as you have enough requisition points, immediately call in your own AA gun. You will find that once the enemy team can't drop into their own base, you will have the control point captured in no time. Control point successfully hacked. It may at first seem that when you destroy a gun turret in an enemy's base, that after time they heal themselves. The but in fact, small sighted. hovering robots rush to any destroyed deployable and heal them back to their full health. However, these small robots can be destroyed. Although they can sometimes be awkward to hit, they are still worth destroying. Even though more do spawn when you destroy them, the extra time can sometimes be the difference maker when attacking a base. Don't go straight to the big gun turrets when deciding what deployable you want to call in. Supply depots are actually pretty useful. Their primary function of resupplying teammates and allowing players to change their classes is handy, but in my opinion, not their best use. Supply depots heal whatever is near them, 
similar to the repair tool. So when calling in a gun turret, also call in a supply depot to sit next to it and keep it healed. Or even take it one step further by calling in an AA gun, then calling in a gun turret to protect the AA gun, and then a supply depot to keep them both healed. The addition of the auto lock on ability is somewhat controversial. Taking the aiming out of a first person shooter is something that you'll rarely see, but the auto lock on doesn't put the game into easy mode. You will rarely be able to kill an enemy purely by using auto lock on. And remember, it's not giving you an advantage, as everyone else has it too. To really make the most of auto lock on, you have to know when to use it. Make sure you enable it when there is no cover between you and the opponent at a time when you won't need to reload and when the opponent is being evasive. I find the best time to use auto lock on is when you know you will kill the enemy before it's finished. This is usually once you have removed their shield and only need to shoot through their armour. Continuing to aim as you come out of auto aim is difficult and with just a few seconds of connecting bullets usually being the deciding factor in a gunfight, auto locking later rather than sooner should see you winning more one-on-one -on -one battles. Before you kill an enemy, you must remove their shield and then their armor. This is similar to Halo, where some weapons are more effective against the enemy player's shields and some against their armor. It is therefore useful to have one gun that is effective against their shields and another one that is effective against their armor. Use your first gun to take away their shield and then quickly switch to your secondary to finish them off. Use this method in combination with Wall 3 by shooting off their shield, then switching guns, locking on and then finishing them off. You can change the ammo type on almost every gun to decide if you want it to be more lethal against shields or armour, so this tactic won't even stop you from using your favourite gun. To win a game of Conquest, your team has to obtain 1,000 victory points. You gain victory points by killing enemy players, capturing control points and completing dynamic combat missions. Killing enemies only earns you a small amount of victory points, so to win a game, you need to focus your attention on control points and DCMs. Knowing when to go after DCMs and when to attack or defend capture points can often be the decider in game. If your team has most points captured, it is usually safe to go after a DCM to try and increase your score. But if the enemy has more points controlled, attacking them should be your priority. When the enemy has a DCM, it is important to stop them from completing it. Setting up gun turrets, and especially anti-air guns, near the objective can often be enough to stop them from completing the mission. I therefore use DCM missions as a distraction for the enemy and take the opportunity instead control to capture point their control enemy. points. After experience, you will learn when to target DCMs and when to ignore them. Take into consideration the difficulty of the mission, the amount of capture points your team controls, control and the number of your team attempting to complete the mission. So just spend a few seconds to assess the situation before blindly chasing a waypoint. By following these 10 rules and putting in some time online, you will be dominating the battlefield in no time.